Angiosperms, or flowering plants, are characterized by having fruits enclosing the seed or multiple seeds inside. But before there is a fruit, there must be a flower. And what happens between the flowering and the fruiting stage? Pollination. To put it simply, during this process, pollen from anthers, which are the male reproductive parts, gets transferred onto a stigma, a part of the female reproductive structure. After that, fertilization can occur. You've all probably witnessed the process of pollination without necessarily knowing it. Think about all those times you saw an insect visiting a flower. Butterflies, bees, wasps, flies, beetles, or even moths are the important players in the pollination process. They all visit flowers for various reasons. They come to flowers to feed on pollen, suck sugary nectar, or sometimes just to find a place to hide from harsh environments or predators. During all these encounters with flowers, their bodies can get covered in pollen grains, whether it's intentional or not. Honeybees, for example, the poster child for pollinators, not only feed on pollen while they're on a flower, but they also actively collect and accumulate pollen grains to bring back to their hives to feed their larvae. They have special structures to harvest and store the pollen, and they pile up the pollen grains mixed with nectar and carry it back to the hive. You can see it very clearly, as these bees have big orange or yellow clumps of pollen sticking to their hind legs. It looks a bit like they overdid it with calf exercises in the gym. Other types of insects don't necessarily collect and bring back pollen to feed their youngsters like the bees do, but the pollen grains do get accidentally stuck on their bodies while they're visiting the flower for any of the reasons mentioned earlier. When insects fly from one flower to another, they spread the pollen grains that get caught on their bodies as they brush against the anthers. Pollination occurs when a pollen grain from one plant species lands on a stigma of a flower of the same species. It can be either on the same plant, this is self-pollination, or a different plant, this is called cross-pollination. When the male pollen is compatible with female stigma and the circumstances are favorable, the process of fertilization begins. By the way, some stigmas get sticky to encourage the pollen grains to stay, this is very obvious in lilies, for example. Pollen, which comes from male reproductive plant parts, anthers, produces male gametes, sperm. Inside each pollen grain are two cells, the vegetative one and the reproductive one. Under suitable conditions, the pollen grain starts to germinate after landing on a stigma. This happens by production of a pollen tube from the vegetative cell. The pollen tube grows down through the style towards the ovary. During this process, the reproductive cell divides and creates two sperm cells that travel down the pollen tube. Eventually, the pollen tube reaches an ovule, enters it usually via the micropyle, which is a small opening, and delivers the sperm cells inside. There might be one or more ovules in the ovary, depending on the plant species. Inside of an ovule, there is an embryo sac in which there is an egg cell. The male sperm joins with the female egg to form a zygote. But do you remember we had two sperm cells total? While the first one fuses with the egg cell, the other one fuses with the central cell containing the polar nuclei in the embryo sac to form the endosperm. The endosperm will serve as a food storage for the developing seed. So because we had two fusions, this process is known as double fertilization, a process unique to angiosperms. The fertilized ovule develops into a seed and the ovary around it becomes a fruit. You can see this as the ovary enlarges and eventually grows to its full size and ripens into a mature fruit. So as you can see, flowers absolutely need to get pollinated to be able to reproduce. But insects are not the only pollinators who can take on the task, even though they dominate. Birds, bats and other small mammals can also pollinate flowers such as these cute honey blossoms pictured here pollinating Banksia. Wind also plays a key role in transporting pollen in certain plant species. The majority of gymnosperms overall rely on wind for their reproduction. Check out my video about the pine reproduction to see more details about the gymnosperm life cycle. But in angiosperms, only a small percentage of species are pollinated by wind. 
wind-pollinated flowers don't need to attract pollinators, so they're usually very small, inconspicuous and often lack petals. Think of willows and their catkins, or the flowers of grasses. Plants relying on animal pollinators have an interest in making them visit, so they've evolved features that help them lure these pollinators. This might be a particular color, scent, intriguing pattern or overall shape of the flower. Sometimes they even trick the insect. Look at this plant. This is Mojavia confertiflora, and its flowers don't produce any nectar to attract and reward insects. However, they look a lot like the nectar-rich Mancelia involucrata, a species of plant that often grows in the same areas. Mojavia has evolved mimicry, so not only does it look a lot like Mancelia, but on top of that, its flowers have a maroon spot inside of their corolla, which makes it appear that there's a female bee hiding in there. This attracts male bees in search of females to visit the flower, and while they leave empty-handed, the plant gets what it needs. It gets pollinated. If you like this video, please hit that like button below and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week.